So basically, uh, I don't know how often you go to the actual, to the actual meetup page, but there, there's a rich set of kind of like mail settings depending on what kind of notifications via email you want to get or not. I, I would recommend you actually revisit that and see if that's what you want. But basically where it does end up is here under discussions and then message board. Uh, there's, a, there's a specific message board called job opportunities. And that's where I'm directing everyone who wants to um, post a job opportunity to kind of publish. Um, and if I click here, you'll see that recently there were like four or five posted with, with very few views, right? Um, and I realize people are probably not that aware um, of this. So, you know, it's, it's up to you. You can set your, your, your email preferences or you can from time to time come here. But I just wanted to, you know, bring your attention that um, this, this particular message board kind of started. Um, Are you hiring two, Norman? Say again? Are you hiring two? Am I hiring two? What are One of the messages by <laughs> Oh, uh, no, that's the, I, I can actually open that one. That is just me posting because um, Brian Tucker from Philadelphia forwarded it to me and said, you know, the guy <coughs> from your group might be interested, so I thought, okay, I'll, uh, I'll just post this. But it's, it's clear from here, like, who's hiring. Is that, is that thing on me? Um, so that's, that's about that. Um, before we start with actual talks, uh, there's at least one person who has an announcement to make, right? Do you, you want to come here and sure. Hi. Uh, <coughs> my name is Hal Hay. Um, with the firm Cabot Research. We're located in Boston and do analytics. We for sophisticated analytics for uh, institutional portfolio managers. Uh, and we've had a service up and running for a few years now and we're rebuilding it all using the new technologies in the back end and Lyft and Scala on the front end. And uh, so we're now, we're one of the job postings, I think we're the... This one right yeah, right there. So uh, we're, you know, we're ready, we have an opening now. And uh, so if anyone's interested, uh, or knows someone who might be interested, uh, please come talk to me, I'll be there with this thing. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, and I forgot to mention, uh, the, the pizza tonight is sponsored by my company, Boston Technologies. Thank you. Okay, so okay, I start it. And then, uh, yeah, you can go. With it. Well, it's normally really funny because uh, with my, my day job, most of my colleagues have Macs, and when they're faced with my machine, which is a Windows machine, they're like, "Oh no, what do I do now? Where's the magic button that I press to get to the presentation?" But Norman is, of course, a PC guy as well. So not all that fun. Right. So, <coughs> welcome everyone to the second. Um, the second global launch, first US outing of the Scala Puzzle. So, this was uh, the first time was the Scala Days this year in the Barbican when it was one of the last sessions on the second day, which was, went down very well. I have to say it was a fun reaction. It's a very light-hearted talk. I mean, of course, the point is if you see some errors of the Scala language, so there's a bit head scratching. That's why I guess they're called puzzlers. But this is not like we're not going to be doing a cake pattern or type classes or anything far too uh, you know, mind-bending here. The background to this one is quite fun. Um, it predates my time in Boston when Norman sent me an email saying, oh, I have this idea about Scala puzzles. And there's an old, old post on the Scala dev group from like 1974 or something like that. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, uh, as we see, it's all very well to have an idea, but it obviously takes something like two years before it actually happens. And I think today, at the end of today, we are going to see the grand launch, finally, with this idea, sort of the, the Titanic will be launched today. Um, okay, so seriously, so what are we going to talk about? What's a puzzler? Well, I mean, first of all, um, in this context, a puzzler is an intentional language feature, so it's not a bug in the Scala compiler or something that is just broken in the language. It has to be the way the language is supposed to work, so no bugs. Um, it's not just weird because, you know, you don't know Scala, so it's not like, oh my god, what's this? Uh, Weird operator with a percent sign and a uh, angle bracket after it. No, no, it really has to be something that that is um, not just a, a lack of knowledge of the Scala language. And now this is when it gets a little bit fuzzy. It should be something that is surprising or non-intuitive to a reasonably skilled Scala developer for some suitable definition of reasonably skilled. So of course, we can argue about this all in meat hall later, or rather you all can 
would like you badly because I have to run. That's why my bag is not here. Um, but anyway, so this is, uh, this is really what we're trying to get at here. And of course, those people who know the Java puzzles um, will perhaps recognize some of these ideas. It's not a, uh, you can decide which of us is Josh and which of us is, so that's going to be fun by the end. But um, this is really what we're after here today. So um, these are all tested uh, against 292. Uh, they were tested on the plane over to London for Scala days, and I hope 292 hasn't magically morphed since then. So this was all stuff <laughs> that was still current and working on 292, and of course the idea is as new versions come out, to try and make sure that they stay puzzlers. Now I know some of you I'm just seeing there's a laptop in the background, so Alexander is very quick at typing. If he's not working on his presentation right now, then of course he could open up the REPL and do all these examples as we're doing them. And I can, that's all fine, but I promise you it's more fun if you don't. You can all do this at home, the code samples are out there, you can look at them, but it's more fun to sit here and kind of think about this. So um, no REPL for the moment, please. And having said that, yeah, let's get going. And I will now hand over to you. Okay, so let's start um, kind of as a warm up, nice and easy. <coughs> so we have a um, snippet of code here for statements. Um, and it's, it's, very, it's very simple. Basically, you can see in the first statement, we're just uh, mapping elements of a, of a list, uh, basically due to their increments. The, the second statement is basically just um, <coughs> a syntax shortcut for, for the first statement. So pretty much does the same. And then uh, we just passed it up a little bit by uh, actually uh, introducing a side effect by printing um, high on the, on the screen and actually doing everything else the same. So um, the question here is, what is this code gonna kind of print out? And um, I will give you a little bit more time. I think this one, the, the answers appear on the same one. So oh, okay. Should be a, oh, no, my mistake. Yeah, actually, oh, so, my bad. So I'll, I'll leave a couple, just a little bit more time so that you can try to figure out what is actually going to be printed here on the screen. Um, and then we'll go over possible answers. Do they always compile? Yeah, ah, we'll see. Well, this one's a well, lesson well. Well, actually, it's, it's going to be mentioned like okay. in, in the possible answers. You know, it doesn't compile or, okay. or, or it throws an exception during runtime or stuff like that. And a good, another good question that people ask at Scala is, of course, the idea is that there's not like 10,000 lines of Scala code <coughs> before this, and you haven't done a lot of stuff. This is just open up a REPL and type the code you see and go. That's really great. Right. Okay. So I guess that was, that was enough time. So let's go over possible answers. So you can see here, all four options, the first two lines are the same, because that was pretty easy, right, the first, the first two statements. Um, I, but I guess the question is how many times the, uh, the, the word high is going to be printed. So uh, going for a little bit more time here. Do you want to see the answers again, by the way? So please shout. No, right. right. Um, let's, let's try to, to, to take a guess. So how many, how many people think it's the, the correct is A? And, and don't, don't, don't be shy about hands, because uh, <coughs> We're videoing this and we're going to record how many times you try this. And then you will be automatically disqualified from all the jobs that you get more than three wrong times. Okay, so, so it seems like nobody, nobody says A. How many people think it's B? Okay, I don't know what. How many people think it's C? Okay, and D? Nobody, okay. So it's and ignore her, she knows the answers. <laughs> okay, so it seems like it's either B or C. So let's see, it's actually C. So. Basically, why is it C? What, what happens here? Where, well, first keep in mind that um, Scala, Scala allows wherever a, an expression is expected, you can actually replace that with a block of expressions, where the last one actually determines the result, right? So what, what happens in the first one is map expects a function to be provided, right? And as a side effect, we will see high printed ones. Uh, Actually, sorry, I take that back. Basically, through every iteration, through every passive map, we will see high printed, and, and also the, uh, the every element map to, to its increment. But in the second case, basically, um, in this block of code, the function is the second statement. So that's what gets returned. And uh, high gets printed only once, because that's actually a side effect while evaluating this, uh, this block of code. Uh, so 
that's the reason, essentially, oh, sorry, that, that's the reason you see a high twice uh, the, in the first one, but the second one produces only once. Did that make any sense to everyone? So even though the simplification looks exactly the same, what you end up with the second time around is not a function. It's a compound expression, which has a side effect and then a function. Was that puzzling? Yes. See, the problem with puzzles is, of course, the obvious answer kind of by definition is out. Anyway, so, um, so now we're going to move on to the first of two puzzles that are involving tuples. And um, I think what we'll see, and hopefully, again, uh, we'll talk about this a bit later, this is going to hopefully become a community effort. It's not like we're inventing these puzzles, and we're just collecting them. You all have puzzles, and I'm sure Paul Phillips has 5,000 puzzles just in the back of his uh, head, and all this kind of stuff. So what we'll see is that there are certain puzzles in certain areas of the Scala language, and I think that's a, yeah, it's an interesting an interesting thing I'm looking uh, at, at seeing where in the Scala language potentially certain things are quite tricky. So, what are we doing here? Well, it looks pretty simple. We're um, doing a bit of pattern matching. Well, in the second one, in the first one, we're just assigning a variable. And note, by the way, that um, those two uh, characters that we're assigning are strings. Huh? So, the question is, what actually happens when you do this? So, the first one is, well, we know it works. You know, some Scala is something special and you know, is able to do this properly. Um, the second one is, uh, well, nothing works at all. Uh, and can't even compile it. The third one is, well, they compile, but they break when you try to run them. And then uh, E is a kind of interesting mixture of the two. Brian's getting help already. Phoning a friend. Do you want some more time? Uh, I think I still see people thinking that's good. They're positive. Give me 15 seconds. We'll be nervous now. Okay, so who thinks it's A? Works. One. Who thinks it's B? Right. Who thinks it's C? Nobody. And who thinks it's D? A whole bunch of people. So the wisdom of crowds. Did the wisdom of crowds get it right? Yes! The wisdom of crowds got it right. And the wisdom of crowds probably also knows why. It's an interesting thing here. Um, even though that second segment, uh, um, the pattern match looks nice and tight, it's actually not. Because um, and if you add, if you run the, uh, if you run the record with um, uh, unsafe, uh, what did I say? But if you write, yeah, um, then you'll get a warning here at this point, because um, you know, uh, pattern matching in, in Scala is type erased. So what happens in the second statement? Well, the first one obviously fails, and that's true. You're trying to assign. A tuple two of strings to a tuple two of ints, and that obviously doesn't type check. But the second one type checks perfectly well because you're really just trying to do a pattern match on two objects, on um, two variables, and that's fine. But then when you try to run it, uh, the compiler then has to go, or the, the, rather the runtime then has to go and try and cast the things that it matches to two ints, and then it blows up with a class cast exception. So pattern matching yeah, is not time safe. Oh, wow. Okay, so let's go to the next one. Very similar to the previous one. Uh, some things are a little, little bit different. So for example, instead of vowels, we have bars. Um, the variable names are uppercase here. And the question is, uh, <coughs> what will this piece of code do? So here are the, the, the four options. Um, I'll give you guys some time to think about it. Has everybody picked one answer or do you need some more time? Okay. 
Okay. So let's give it a try. So who thinks uh, the correct answer is A? Okay. Uh, B? Nobody? Okay. C? Raise your hands. And D? Okay, one person. So uh, it seems it's going to be A or C. C. So the correct answer is C. So the reason C is the correct answer is basically uh, there's, there's nothing uh, there's nothing strange about the first one. You can name your variables using the uppercase. Um, so uh, that would certainly work. The problem is, it, is with, the, with the second one. So as Andrew explained from the previous puzzler, um, when you're trying to do a sign in Scala, the left-hand side, uh, so you can, you can either assign to your variable or it's going to do the pattern match. Um, and in this case, basically doing pattern match, there, there's a rule in Scala that if the variables uh, start with the uppercase, then they're treated as constants, and it's going to try to match against them. So uh, basically, at this point, the compiler cannot find the scope of uh, these variables at all, and it basically uh, fails to compile. Any questions about it? It's obvious, right? <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I mean, I, I put my hand up at A because that's, what, of course, what I think should happen. <laughs> it's totally absurd, uh, I mean, frankly, if you ask me. Suddenly, uppercase variables become something that <coughs> That's the Scala language view, I guess. That's why we're here, because there's certain positive things. Right, more blocks of code, nicely syntax highlighted. Um, it, it's quite a it's much more code than we've seen so far, but this is actually pretty simple. What we have here is a uh, class hierarchy. We have a, or rather, a trait at the top. And then we have two, ooh, ooh, wow, I'm in control now, the magic one. So um, it's a class hierarchy, oh, this is the laser pointer? Yay. Um, and then we have two classes that just extend from it. And they're pretty similar. So the, the, the train A has an abstract variable foo, and it declares a variable bar, um, or a value rather, with a value 10, and then it prints out the values when it's being constructed. And then, as I, as I said, it has two subclasses, B1 and B2. And they're pretty much the same. They both print out the values that you will see at this point. And the only place they really differ is where they actually initialize the abstract variable foo. And then all we're doing at the end is we're actually instantiating uh, one variable of each. So we'll have a look at the code again in a second, just so you can go back to it. But let's have a look at what the, uh, what the options are that we're giving you here. So basically, of course, if we make the v1 and the v2, then it will call the constructors, and then we'll see the print statements being executed. So if you look at the differences across these various ones, really it's a difference about you know, visibility. When do certain things start to become visible? Here, they're all visible all the time. Here, you know, they're not visible until a certain point, and then we have a variation between the two. So I'll go back to the color briefly. So we can flick back and forth here a few times until everybody's kind of seen enough of what's going on. So just to, as a reminder, parent class, or the trait rather, and then we have two subclasses there, both of which initialize foo to be 25. Okay, everybody seen enough of the code? Show you the answers again. <coughs> Well, the way to visualize it is due to Norman, Norman rather, who um, 
or explain it to me in this way, is that when you're instantiating a parent, you have to visualize that the parent constructor happens here. So after the class declaration, but before the first line inside the class constructor. So if you take this block up here and you put it inside here, then you get what we saw. Uh, it prints zero because it doesn't have a value yet, and then it's assigned 25, and then you get 25. Um, in this case, for some reason, moving this same declaration into the class constructor uh, makes it visible at the right time. So another case where, and I'd be actually interested to know, I haven't looked this up in total detail, I'm sure this is obviously part of the Scala language spec, but I'd like to know why this is considered um, to be uh, two different things. Anyway, so just, uh, just as, a, as a helpful hint, when you try to visualize the instantiation order, imagine the parent instructor happening after the first line. Okay. <coughs> Again, trouble with traits. Um, similar code, but actually we have a different hierarchy here. So we, we have a base trait, and then we have B extending it, and then C extending uh, B. Um, and then we're just instantiating C. So uh, the question here is what is going to get printed out on, on the screen? And basically you just have to focus on pull and bar. Um, so I'll, I'll leave you with that a little bit. Maybe this is not a hidden trick. Uh, in C we're overriding the bar. Right, right yeah, don't, don't, remember, don't, don't forget this. So here are the possible answers. So let's go on the description a bit more. Click on here. <laughs> Excuse me. So it seems that B should win. Proof that the Scala language really is puzzling. The current answer is A. So basically what, what happens here, so going back to the code again, is if you so keep it so for A for was it was 0, 0, 25, 0, 25, Okay. So basically what happens here, the only trick is that um, who, who is a value here, which is actual, right? It's, it's not initialized at this point. Uh, so it has a default value of zero. Um, and then, uh, basically, it's, it's normal that it's going to be zero here. Uh, that, that's kind of expected. Now, when it comes to bar, it is initialized here to 10. But keep in mind that it's overridden here. And bar is a value. So values are or should be only initialized once. <coughs> and so the compiler knows that the final initialization is going to happen here, so it picks actually that one. So at this point, even as it's 10, bar has a default value, which is 0, because it's really going to be initialized here. And then as we go here, right, um, foo basically gets initialized to 25, so it, so it is 25, and bar is still going to be 0 because it's going to be initialized here, even though it said it was 10 here. And then here it's kind of obvious that it should be 25.99. It's final. So the value is final. You can't re-initialize final variable. So you couldn't set it to 10 up there and then to 99 down there because you'd be resetting a final variable. The compiler knows it has to become 99, but it only becomes 99 down here. So before the initialization, it's got its default value, which is 0. If it were a null, if it were an object, you'd get null pointer exceptions. And if you took out the other right, you wouldn't. No, that would write null. Because you've said it. And there are actually, it's very valuable to set. 
If there are actually workarounds to this, you can easy you can either use lazy vowels or you can do uh, you can eagerly initialize uh, variables. But um, if, if you don't do that, basically the whole trick is. Oh, there are a whole really. I mean, the, the the source where this comes from. If you're interested in this, this is one of Paul Phillips's at the Hughes. A million more complicated ways in Scala of achieving this kind of initialization with like uh, partial instantiation before that one kind of stuff. But um, yeah, if you take away the override, you get 0, 10, as you would expect, or 10, 10. Right. That clearly was puzzling. Nobody <laughs> got it. Cool. Well, at least Scala still has some surprises left in store, uh, aside from trying to understand the Scala problem. <laughs> Um, so this is um, this is getting a bit back to sort of simpler things here. Um, well, the types are a little bit weird, but, but I'll talk about that in a second. This is really a, a rather poor, <coughs> non funny bar, not the ideal way of implementing uh, a sum of collections. So the idea here is that you have a bunch of collections, you know, some oranges, some apples, some pears, and some cars, and some Scala developers, and whatever, and you just want to sum up the sizes of each of the collections. So what you're taking in as an input is an iterable, basically a collection of other collections. The reason of the types is that um, traversable once is where the size thing is defined. But basically, you take a collection of collections, and all you do is you map each collection to its size. So you know you have some oranges, and you convert that to its size, and so on, and then you sum all the sizes up. Now, of course, this is much nicer done using something like fold left or fold right. Uh, somebody pointed out that Scala Day is quite correct, that here you're traversing the list twice, which is rather unnecessary, once to do the mapping and then to do the sum, but who cares? Um, we're not all expert Scala developers. And then we're going to call this thing, just with a sort of variance of different things, we're going to try and sum the sizes of a collection of uh, maybe apples here and pears over here, or ints and ints to be precise, and then we're going to take a list of Scala developers and a set of Pascal developers. And we're going to try and sum that as well. So what do we get? Do we get 4-4, four, four, which seems obvious because there's 2 in here and 2 in here? Do we get 4-2? Uh, do we get 2 and 4? Or do we get 2 and 2? That's even more than weird. Wrinkled eyebrows. It's good. It's a good sign. We're the only talk that will make you age visibly. <laughs> um, make sure the living doesn't wrinkle up too much. So, and again, I mean, the implementation, of course, can be done much nicer, but it's not a complicated thing. We're taking it, we're mapping each element to its size, and then summing them all up. <coughs> we just picked our favorite horse in the race. Who thinks it's A? So we get 4 and 4. What do you expect? One person. Good for you. Good courage. Who thinks it's 4 and 2? A few people. Oh, more people. More people. Courage. Uh, who thinks it's 2 and 4? One person. Also good. And who thinks it's 2 and 2? Good. We have, we have a perspective. Well, I think the wisdom of crowds kind of wins out of this one. It is, in fact, 4 and 2. And uh, note, by the way, that this is only weird because, and you'll see what the reason is in a second, if this thing had 3, everything would work as you think. So what am I saying by this? In other words, if this thing had 3 elements rather than 2, then you would get 5 both times. But this doesn't work because since the collection's redesigned and then all this can, uh, can generate from and all kinds of nice things, um, Scala is good at giving you back not just any random collection, but actually the type of collection that you put in in the first place. So in the second instance here, note that what we start off with is a set. What is the characteristic of sets? Sets cannot contain <coughs> elements. So when you're doing the mapping, it obviously crunches this down to 2, because that's the size of this one, and then it crunches this one down to 2 as well. And then it tries to put them in a set, and it doesn't work. So if this were any other, if this were an array or any other interval, everything would be fine. But just because of the way Scala gives you back exactly the same type of collection um, that you have, this one doesn't work as expected. So beware of this. And I mean, 
Obviously, if you had set up, oh my god, just a fast forward or backward through a whole set of the presentation. If you had sets up here in the type definition, then you would think, well, it's a stupid program <coughs> state because you should know that sets cannot. But we're not talking about any types of sets up here. We should just play collections. You are, to some extent, caught by what the developer happens to pass in as well. Okay? Okay, and the last one. Okay. Double, take a little longer. Right, so this one is a little bit tricky, so I'll give some um, explanations. So um, let's first cover this, this first line, uh, the definition of the, of the square function. Uh, so this here on the left-hand side, what you see is a complex bond, right? So before scala 2.8, you can just imagine you had to write another uh, parameter list which accepts a parameter, which would basically be of type numeric of t, the same thing we have here. But since Scala 2.8, you, you can actually uh, write in a more concise way and get the same effect. Uh, so, so basically, we have this function square, which accepts one parameter of type t. And then here, with this implicitly, we're actually accessing that implicit value, uh, which is of type numeric t. And then on whatever gets resolved, whatever <coughs> the scope that, that satisfies this condition, it will it, it, the, the times method will be called on that, uh, providing any net. So basically, that's a definition of a square. And now, <clears throat> what we have here is four different ways of actually uh, getting, um, of basically composing square function with itself. So if or you or have a parameter, second? or any function, actually. right? So if you have uh, a parameter parameter n, right? So this would return you um, n to 2, right? After this, you would have n to the 4. Um, and the difference is, is basically in the parameters or the parameter list. Um, and, what, and what it comes to basically here, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit, is uh, it has to do with the, uh, with the compiler inferring the correct types. So this is the four calls here. And uh, basically, the question is, what's going to happen? And there are a lot of possible scenarios where the compilation will fail. And basically, there's one view which says everything will work. But I'll leave you some time here to think. Um, with that hint that I told you that, um, that, that the trick here is with the compiler basically inferring the, the type of key. Well, maybe, maybe also one thing I should two is obviously an, an int. So clearly, there is a numeric int exists, right? I mean, there is a, a type class numeric int that allows you to multiply an integer by itself. And of course, you'd like to just go n times n, but that doesn't work. <coughs> you have to use this numeric int thing. And what we're really trying to do is to calculate 2 to the 4, as Norman already said. That's why 16 is one of the possible answers of it. Does it make sense to everyone what's going on here, at least? <laughs> okay. So let's, so let's see. So how many people think it's going to be A? How many people think it's going to be B? No. C? A little bit more. And, and D? Just a few. Okay. That's, that, that means that C should be the answer. But it actually is not. The A is the correct answer. So, Basically, what happens here is, um, so, so we, we can see from the correct answer, the, the only time that com the compiler can actually uh, infer the type of t is in this fourth case. So basically calling this twice b. 
And the reason is you would even expect in the first case to work because we are passing two here, which is of type int. So you would think that in kind of in parallel or in the same time, the compiler would say, okay, um, there is a type parameter here, and a is of type int, so then this function must be of int to int, right? But actually, it doesn't work that way. Uh, the Scala compiler uh, analyzes the, the, the types uh, independently, and when it does infer a type, it can only transfer that knowledge to the second parameter list, not to the second parameter within the same parameter list. So that's really the trick. So basically, the compiler has no way of inferring that in the first three cases, even though we are always passing an integer. And the only time it can do is in the fourth case because it infers what was basically obvious that, it, that the t is uh, in, in, in this case. And then it knows it transfers that knowledge to the next parameter list. Uh, and obviously in this case, if we said uh, in all these cases, if we said square of int, you know, giving a hint to the compiler, then all, of, all four would work. But we're not doing that and basically um, the, the way the inference works with, with transferring the knowledge to the different primary list is the entire trick here. So that's why the first three would actually fail to compile. And the, the failure is they say I can't find the value of type numeric t. Even though it's clear, it looks like it's clear that t is an int. It just doesn't start, the compiler doesn't know that. It claims it doesn't have enough information so it's normally expected. Right. And in this, I, I also found this interesting because uh, sometimes people um, would ask, like, what, what's the point in Scala? You can, and certainly uh, a lot of functions you can define with a single parameter list and just multiple parameters. Or you can have multiple parameter lists, right, with fewer parameters. Um, and there, there are a couple of cases where it makes sense, but I think also one use case for that would be here, basically, to, to help compiling for the types. Uh, so you, you can kind of keep that in mind. Uh, yeah. That's our explanation in the middle source. OK, so what, what, we're, what we're planning to do now, and did you want to do? Oh, no, sure. Go ahead. OK, <coughs> so we're out of the background. So we're fine. Sure. <coughs> oh, yeah, that exit full screen. Well, that's correct. That's my profile. Yay, it's me. Anybody who's coming down to the Cloud News Conference? You just go to another firewall. So. Yeah, no, it's, it's, let me just find it. It's at like full screen this time. <coughs> Okay, so basically, our idea, what, what we're going to do here is basically make the scalapuzzlers.com website live. Um, and as, as I'm, after we do that, we'll, we'll explain the whole idea behind it. Um, so basically, what I'm just going to do is just accept this one pull request. And we're now totally at the mercy of GitHub's DNS server. <laughs> You want to log in? <coughs> oh no, we're not logged in there. Ah, tragic, tragic. So I'll have to log in. Uh, sure, let me, let me log in. Did you log in? Oh my god, help. No. See, so the demo failed already. But we can, we can look at the site anyway. Now I capture Norman's login. <laughs> Here on the left hand side, 
just going like to one to one example. And basically, you can see here that everyone, in addition to the title, everyone has this contributor block, basically to credit the, the, the person that contributed. And uh, we, we also specify the source, actually linked to it. And then, as you are offered different possibilities, once you kind of figure out what the correct one should be, there's an explanation on the bottom, and also the uh, correct one selected. So, anyways, here on the how to contribute page, there um, it's actually very simple because you just have to fork the the, uh, the, the repo on GitHub and basically um, fill, fill up the, the the template file, which basically describes this puzzler and uh, just issue a pull request, and, and that's it. So, uh, you know, feel feel free as you. Um, come across something that you think is puzzling, you know, just to um, kind of just submit a pull request and, uh, you know, after careful examination by Andrew and me, uh, it might be <coughs> uh, kidding, of course. Yes, we do accept bribes. Bribes are much appreciated. <laughs> Pray for beer will go a long way to ensure your puzzler makes it to the top. So um, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just check, I think. It's let's check it. Let's see. We'll see whether the DNS has refreshed. No, it's and not that, here. Please go and tweet, folks. Tell everybody about all the great stuff. No! Ah, Norman, fail. No, it, normally it took about five minutes last time. Yeah, okay. But anyway, get up and yeah. by the end of this meeting, this will be up and running. And then, uh, yeah, we certainly look forward to hearing from everybody who has puzzles to contribute. Was that fun? Yeah. 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 We all Pretty good job. Cool. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So a little bit of background, uh, you might remember actually in the previous, I haven't done it in a while, but in previous meetings I had to carry like these kind of physical tickets, right? <laughs> and in the box and kind of do it in some plane. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.